Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the SBG podcast. What you're about to watch is a conversation I had with um, Tim Tackett in March 10th, 2021. Um, for those that don't know Tim, if you're more of an MMA or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu fan, he was one of the early students of Jeet Kune Do. Uh, he began training martial arts back in the 60s. He actually had a Kung Fu school here in the very early 60s, back when nobody really even knew what Kung Fu was. I didn't know that till this interview. Um, met Bruce Lee, trained um, the very early Dan and Asano group. So it was a real honor for me to talk to about, uh, Tim. He has so much martial arts history. He's been there through the whole evolution from the karate and kung fu days of the 60s through the Ed Parker, meeting those guys uh, through Ed Parker and the tournaments all the way up to modern MMA and, and working with um, – MMA legends like Eric Paulson. So I did, it did dawn on me that some people might think it odd that I'm going to have a conversation with uh, a, a Jeet Kune Do elder when I've talked a lot about training methods and put out the videos at the very end of the nineties where I talked about aliveness and talked about all the things that I, I don't like in, in JKD training and in martial arts in general. And I th thought that'd be a good time to just talk about a, an important principle my philosophy on martial arts and on truth as it relates to martial arts and training after talking to Tim, I don't think is very different from Tim's and certainly not from Bob Bremer and some of the other early people in Jeet Kune Do. The difference is I said things publicly, but what I always, when I was talking and when I talk about martial arts, I'm talking about systems. I'm talking about primarily training methods. And I think it's very important. Um, to talk about those things openly and to have those kind of conversations about what works and what doesn't work publicly and to say the same thing uh, in front of a group of a hundred people or on a podcast like this that's going on the internet that I would say privately. So if I have, if I watch a, a, something related in martial arts and I think it's bullshit and I, I have somebody I care about who's close to me and I'm going to say that's bullshit, I'm going to say it's bullshit to everybody else too, because that's what I believe is important for my personal integrity. But it's also important to, to understand the distinction. I'm talking about systems and I'm talking about training methods. I'm not talking about people. Um, systems and training methods and techniques and ideology and dogma are not things that should just be granted a kind of respect. Human beings should be granted respect, but we never want to make um, ideas or philosophies or principles, something that we can no longer debate or talk about publicly. When that happens, it's very dangerous. And that happens a lot in martial arts. Taboos are created, sacred cows are created, and people get misled when that happens. So for me, there's no conflict. I um, am completely devoted to truth and martial arts, and I have run SBG that way. And what we do in, as an organization is only what we believe works. And at the same time, I'm eternally grateful to the generation that came before me. If it wasn't for guys like Tim Tackett, if it wasn't for uh, the people that came before us, I wouldn't have the vantage point I have now. And I find it, um, what I find truly disrespectful and, and what, I've, what bothers me a lot, it seems to go on a lot these days, is to be able to have this vantage point. I have this, this great vantage point from all the decades of martial arts that I've had to be able to look at all the, the ongoing experiment we've had with the UFC, my exposure to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, all the things I've done. And I'm standing up here and I'm standing on the shoulders of people like Tim and the people that came before and to have a vantage point like that. And then to look down on our ancestors and what they've done that I really do find disgusting. So to me, somebody like Tim Tackett and the other people that came before us is, is someone that is indeed worthy of a great deal of respect. It was an honor for me to talk to him. It was an honor to be able to hear about some of the stories that he had, um, which I think you'll find interesting too. It's an honor to be able to get those on video for future generations, um, not just SBG students, but everybody else. You guys can watch it and you can learn. And also an opportunity for me to talk to you about the difference. So, you know, um, I'm always going to tell the truth about training methods. I'm always going to tell the truth about um, what I believe works and what doesn't work in martial arts and everything else for that matter. And at the same time, I'm always going to be respectful and grateful for that generation that came before me that paved the way that allowed me to do that. Um, and I think that's the, that's how things should be. And, and one of the best, how we should operate when we're 
when we're doing things with integrity. So anyway, it was a, it was a great honor to talk to Tim. I hope you enjoyed as much as I do, and I'll see you in the next video. Well, thank you very much for doing this, Tim. I'm excited to talk to you. Okay, no problem. Most of my uh, most of our viewers are going to be MMA and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu people. Sure. Um, and so I'm anticipating that there's going to be uh, quite a few people that probably haven't haven't heard of you yet because we don't have a lot of necessarily JKD people on the channel, but I wanted them to, to get a chance to hear from you and some of the stories that you probably have and talk about training. Uh, but for those people real quick, what would be like a, a description? When did you actually start training in Jeet Kune Do? Well, I, I pressed my first uh, training was back when I was in, gosh, junior high. And I took almost a year of judo at the YMCA. And then, uh, and then the guy left, but I, I did like a YMCA circus there in Redlands, which is kind of a big time circus in town. I mean, we did all kinds of stuff. You know, I did everything from mainly I was did trampoline and all that kind of stuff. So I was fairly accurate, you know, athletic that way. And then I got stationed in, uh, got married and got stationed in Taiwan. And I started doing uh, different Kung Fu things over there. And when I got back to help put myself through college, I opened up a, Kung Fu school, except that was back in 19, end of 1964. Nobody knew what Kung Fu was. No. So I call it the school of Chinese karate. <laughs> and then uh, after uh, I, I saw Bruce in the international tournaments, we had guys fighting in the tournaments, you know, on a regular basis. And I knew Inyasano. I had gone to Ed Parker's school uh, when I first got back and he had me show all the forms and all that nonsense that you do over there. And he, uh, the difference was, uh, my Northern Chinese teachers were, uh, you know, did forms, uh -huh. and, but in my Southern Chinese teacher, my main teacher, uh, there was a Japanese influence. We had a lot of hard sparring. There was blood on the Tommy mats, okay. you know, and that was also, they gave you, you get belts and stuff and there with the other Northern Chinese, you didn't, it was just, you know, whatever. So, uh, Anyway, I knew Inyasano. We went out to dinner that night, him, Steve Gold, and myself, a guy named Jim Grenwald after a, did, at Parker School. And I saw him regularly at all the different karate tournaments because he, he was kind of one of Parker's head assistants, and he would uh, be responsible for making sure all the Parker's fighters were, you know, blah, blah, blah there and everything. So I got to see all those guys sparring and stuff. And, uh, you know, I had students in there and everything. And then after I finally got my MFA in uh, drama from UC Riverside, it's like a two-year program. So I, I had my bachelor's degree and then I went for my master of fine arts degree. And uh, I started teaching high school, Thought, started teaching in a place called Montclair about maybe uh, 30 minutes from the house. And uh, I had a friend, my first student was a guy named Bob Chapman. He had been a boxer and Navy boxer and stuff. And we decided, uh, you know, let's go learn something. So I decided I, I was I had Tai Chi. I learned Tai Chi over there from one of those guys. And I, I was teaching it to my drama students for movement. You know, I thought it was very good for concentration and movement. So I went to a Tai Chi teacher, famous one in, uh, in LA. And uh, he asked to show us uh, some uh, of what I was doing. He said, oh, yeah, that Yang style. He's like, what style was I said, I don't know. It was just Tai Chi. And so he said he would take me out as a student. So Bob and I left. We made arrangements to go back there the next Saturday. And this guy, his assistant, followed me out. It turned out to be Dan Lee, who was one of the top of uh, the Jeet Kune Do guys. Yeah. And he said, hey, you're not going to learn anything from this guy. <laughs> you know, because you already know uh, Tai Chi. And so he'll consider you a threat. It's just a kind of a Chinese thing. So, uh, you know, it was really weird because... Uh, I said, but anyway, do you know Dan and Yasano? And I said, yeah. And, you know, you heard of Bruce Lee? And I said, yeah, I, 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 I saw Bruce. And I, I talked to him once, said hi, at a tournament when he was uh, visited at, Kaba, uh, at uh, Takio Kubota's tournament in uh, L.A. area, right in Orange County, I guess, with uh, Kareem Jabbar. I just said, hi, how you doing? He said, hi. That was about it. Nothing, nothing earth shattering or anything. Uh, so I, I was interested in Jeet Kune Do, having, having, you know, listened to watch Longstreet and stuff. And I thought what he was talking about was good. And a lot of the stuff I, I, I'd learned in Taiwan, I found out it wasn't all that good. You know, some of it was, some of it wasn't. Uh, once you start testing it, you start finding out what works and what doesn't, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, here's Daniel Sano's uh, unlisted phone number. So I called him. And he said, oh, yeah, Timmy, I know you just come on down, you know, and uh, uh, bring some, uh, you know, eight, uh, I think it was a uh, 16 ounce gloves, boxing gloves. And I said, sure. Okay. So Bob and I went down there. I said, okay, Bob Chapman goes, yeah. 
there was like about 10 guys in, in his backyard gym. So we sparred the first night. <laughs> and I sparred with Dan Lee and Bob Bremer, and they were both, uh, they were tough guys. Dan Lee had been a boxing champion of, in Shanghai, and Bremer was just a biker, street fighter kind of a dude, you know, and he, so it, it, with Bremer, is what, what worked was important. Anyway, I got to know those guys. I started, started uh, there, and then it happened that as, as a school teacher, uh, the summer camp started opening up, and there was no... Nobody was doing any, any of this Jeet Kune Do for a living at that time. This was back in the late 60s. And so he, uh, Dan got offered to go to Aspen, Colorado to do a, a, a seminar there. And he was uh, shooting Sharky's machine, so he couldn't go. So everybody else, it was famous JKD guys, you know, Jerry Poutine and Bob Bremer, all those guys had a job. Mm -hmm. They couldn't go for a couple months, you know, to, or a month or so to anywhere. And I was the only one that was off, you know. I mean, uh, let's see, Richard Bassoon was working with Continental Airlines. Everybody had a job. There was no, there was no making a living in Jeet Kune Do. Right. And so uh, I went to, to Aspen. A guy there didn't like how it was run, and he, so he started the California Martial Arts Academy. And the guy that was some guy there didn't like us. We started the Smoky Mountains. So I did all the summers. I would do all these camps and stuff. I would go to the Smoky Mountain Camp with my friend Bob Bremer. Or not Bob Bremer, uh, Bert Poe. I don't know if you ever heard of Bert Poe. I've heard about it. Yeah. 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 He was, he was, uh, he was locked at death, that guy. Before, you know, he was a Comanche, half Comanche, uh, uh, you know, you know, did all kinds of war stuff, you know, a little kind of an ivory plate in his head and stuff. But he was, uh, he was uh, very, very much believed in realistic stuff. So when, anyway, I, I started, uh, I knew him because he married, he was quite a few years older than me, but he married a, a, a High school girl I went to high school with in Redlands, California, a girl named Bunny Cabral. And so I knew him from there. He came in to visit my Kung Fu school. He took one look, looked around, watched the training, and left. <laughs> and, uh, so then, uh, years later, I started the JKD. I got permission to teach a few guys at my little place I rented one night a week. And uh, he came in, and we were, you know, kicking and doing stuff. And uh, and uh, all of a sudden, I went, he just started going, yeah. Okay, and he started showing up. He was there all the time because he could see something that was actually worked, you know, that wasn't just, you know, touchy feely, you know, sparred. We, we sparred pretty hard. So that's that's that. And I, then I started just doing more and more JKD and more people from Europe come in. So I started doing that and traveling around and writing books and all that stuff. That all happened because Dan Lee happened to walk out of the Tai Chi place and say, I wasn't going to learn anything. Right. So I had every summer was kind of occupied doing stuff. And then when I retired, uh, when you do seminars in Europe, I never made much money. You do seminars here, but you have hardly anybody there in the summer because uh, if you go to Norway, they're all in Spain right. you know, on vacation. So by the time I, when I retired, I was able to go any time of the year and do some seminars. We had students' classes all over the place. So I retired last year, tired of traveling around, and that's about it. That's, that's my true. journey there. That is very cool. It seems like back in that time, there was a lot going on at Ed Parker's place. So many people seem to have come from Ed Parker's place in the 60s. Well, you got to understand, there wasn't that much. Okay. There was one school in Fontana. There, I visited one Kung Fu guy, and uh, I forgot his name, but he said, you know, if you open school, you could be challenged, you know, to spar, you know, fight, you know. And I said, well, you know, here's my address, you know. Right. Because I, I was a young, you know, I had some beans. And we, we fought a lot, you yeah. know, in, in Taiwan. And he was expecting the traditional Chinese where I used you, you just do forms mm -hmm. that, that wasn't the case of the thing and so uh, but nobody ever showed up you know but that was the end of that too you know was Larry am I correct that Larry Hartzell was also an Ed Parker guy yeah he was an Ed Parker guy so was Bob Bremer uh, so was Dan Lee so was Pete Jacob so was Bob so was uh, uh so was uh yeah. let's see Poteet all of those guys uh, Richard Bastilla was a, a Kaja Kempo guy Ah, okay. a little bit of a harder, you know, harder deal there. And they all, they all just kind of, they were, they were called the turncoats and they, they went over there. In fact, the last time I saw Ed Parker was at Bruce Lee's uh, wife's wedding when she married a uh, uh, bleaker, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, and so I was at the wedding there and I'm at the table with uh, Joy Obeo, my, my wife and Joy Obeo's date and uh, Ed Parker and his wife. And uh, Ed said, are you still with Danny Yasano? And I said, well, yeah. He said, you're, you're loyal, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so he, uh, he really was pissed off about that. They took all of his advanced guys, went over there. Still mad, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so I asked a lot of people what questions they'd have for you. I got some great questions from people, but to be honest, the person that sent me the most interesting questions uh, to think about to ask you was Eric Paulson. Oh yeah, Eric. He's an old friend of mine. He's one of my students at one time. Yeah, he's he's a great guy. And I also worked with some of his fighters, which is interesting. Yeah, I want to I want to talk about that. I want to hear about that. He also mentioned to me, and I didn't realize this. I knew Eric. Had, I consider Eric one of the pioneers of MMA, along with Matt Hume. I don't think either one of them get enough credit. But no, no. I mean, Eric was fighting a long, long time ago in Japan. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. But um, I didn't realize he told me that you were the one that encouraged him to go train and see what the Gracies were doing in 1986. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. And so that was that was before anybody really knew what was going on then. Yeah, I could see that they had a lot of value and stuff, and you know that was important. It had, you know, you never know. You got to be on the ground. You got to do. So you can't say, "I've been in four hundred street fights and never been taken to the ground." I go, "Well, okay, then I worry about you anyway." Being that many street fights, but you know, you got to know what to do. You know, and Bert Poe was very strong on that kind of stuff too, and he knew Eric. Uh, he was very close, so he he knew. You know, you got to be able to. But Bert's thing was, you break something or you take something out. The story I had about Bert that was true, the reason I really got to get to know him before I actually started working with him uh, was because of his wife. But anyway, he, he was a, a sheriff for a while, deputy sheriff in San Bernardino. Uh, I mean, he would do stuff like, uh, he walked in one time, this woman was being held at gunpoint, like, you know, and she's like this, in this, uh, like a 7-Eleven type thing. And the cops are here. She's got the gun there. And so Bert kind of snuck in the back door and just took his, got out of upward angle and just shot him through the occipital bone. <laughs> okay. Right. And the guy just dropped, you know, none of that kind of movies and shit. And the girl was just still standing there. <laughs> yeah. And so he did stuff like that, but he got, he got uh, sort of removed from there for one time. A guy came at him with a, with a, a, a crowbar in an alley. Was a, with a fence there. There was two guys. One guy came out of the crowbar. So he, he took the crowbar. He broke the guy's arm, handcuffed him, and then hung him from the fence to go chase the other guy by his broken arm. They didn't like that, and he had a little bit of trouble about that. So he became a, kind of a security guard at the Thrifties. He was in Palm Springs and working to check it out, the Thrifty stuff there. And these four gentlemen shoplifted some stuff and went out to the car. So Bert went out and he said, just dumb. I stuck his head and said, Hey, what are you guys, you know, you got to come back in there. And all of a sudden there was a gun in his face, the guy in the back seat. So he took the gun away, broke the guy's arm, took his eyeball out and threw it on the dashboard as the car took off. And the guy in the front had a gun. He got shot here and he hit his head and broke his neck. So he was in the hospital. I get a call from Bunny, his wife saying, look, uh, they're trying to get Bert. Uh, because he did, they're getting say he maimed this guy. So they're trying to get him. Would you be a, a, an expert witness to say that what he did was not uh, that bad, that that was what, you know, reasonable what you would do in a situation like that? I said, sure. It never went to court. So I never had to do that. But Bert owed me a little bit. So when he started coming around, he started showing us the stuff that, you, that he learned and who knows God knows who knows where, you know. He said sometimes some of the, some of the British commando. He said when he was he had a Filipino guy when he was working in, in uh, back in like about the end of World War II. That's how old the dude was. Uh, so he had been in one of those raider type groups and stuff. And his uh, his uh, one of his stories was that he was a tall, skinny guy. He looked like he was a Norwegian because his mother had been raped. She was a nurse in uh, with Comanche. So he. Uh, he was there in this group and this, this Filipino guy was going to have him do uh, knife fighting. So he, he has his assistant, a kind of white dude, say, uh, anybody want to try to stop this guy? And, uh, and so this, uh, he had a bird a knife and the assistant goes, cut me. Well, you don't say that, Bert. She just cut, cut him right across the forehead. And the guy went to the hospital and the Filipino guy said, oh, okay, you're my assistant. <laughs> <laughs> so he learned a lot from this guy. Yeah. <laughs> And sometimes working with the British commandos. That's some of the stuff, World War II stuff. Yeah. It's a real serious shit, you know. It really is. And that taking the eye out, he showed us how to do it. It's, it's not that hard. Right. Uh, how to do it. But, you, you know, who the hell wants to, you know. Right. So he's, and then, but they started to say, well, you know, you gouge my eye, I gouge your eye. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, well, I've taken three of them. All I ever did was scream. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a different, it's a different than getting gouged or getting hit. I mean, actually, 
actually uh, pick it in there. And, you know, like sure. Yeah. I think Eric told me one time he brought um, some teeth or something in that were souvenirs to class. He had his, his medicine bag had, a, had three Korean scallops in it. I. But they don't they don't take the whole thing. They just take a little circular thing off the top. You know, so he had that. I had some teeth and a few other things. Gold, some gold teeth and stuff, you know. Yeah, Bert was something else. Uh, I remember one time we went to Inusano, so he had some jerky. And uh, he said, Daniel said, oh, this is, jerky is really good. What is it? He goes, dog. <laughs> <laughs> so that reminds me, um, the next question I was going to ask you, also from Eric, he, he told me I should ask you about your Wednesday night group. where, where he Yeah, was yeah. We're in abeyance right now because of COVID, but uh, I've never charged anything. So uh, we, I started having a little school. I had a school, you know, six nights a week and all that crap when I was te- te- going to school to help r- raise money. When I started with Inusana, we didn't advertise anything. I had one night a week and I rented a place. Then I just moved to my garage. So it's just in our garage class. We did that a long time. And then Bob Bremer started coming around. Bob Bremer was, uh, I, you know, I thought I really knew the JKD. Uh, but Bob was an interesting kind of guy. Okay, he uh, <laughs> we would take two hours of uh, of JKD in the backyard, and, and on two, Thursday night was sparring night, Tuesday night was technique night, and then afterwards, and you know, so I was saying you guys want to learn some escrima. We just starting that. And I said, yeah, I'd like to learn some escrima, and so Bob, Bob and I started learning escrima. He would be there, and uh, and my and Bob uh, Chapman and Bremer and, and Pete and all those guys would take it about a half hour of that, and then. We'd go through all the numbers and stuff. We got the number 12 in the Serata method. You have kind of where you come down like this with the stick and the knife. And Bob said, what's that for? And he said, uh, oh, that's for, um, that's for going under a Japanese armor. Bob said, oh, that was his last Escrima lesson. <laughs> because it wasn't real. You know, he just, his mind was, was that way. I showed, him, I showed Bob and I watched a, so I'm going to even tell you what the martial art was. We saw two hours of a guy doing a seminar, all kinds of fancy stuff. Da, 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 da. He sat there. And I said, what do you think, Bob? And he said, never in my entire life because I've seen so much stuff I didn't want to learn. <laughs> I like this guy. Yeah, he was, he was, uh, he was the real thing. You know, like a, he's the one who, uh, who maybe understand how to make, actually how to make trapping work and then why most of the time you don't need to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, because... The, the way most people teach trapping, it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Uh, mainly because you go with you punch. Uh, he punch, you know, so you punch, he blocks, you trap his hand, blah, 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 blah. You don't, you don't leave your arm out there when you punch. Right. You snap it. So you're snapping your punch, and there's nothing for him to this guy to throw anything on to, you know? So uh, Bob... You don't have the concept of cutting into the tool, but you when you do the trapping, okay, let's say, let's, let me go through it simply first. There's a thing that Bruce called, uh, uh, if I can think of what the hell the name of it is, it's called the time commitment theory, okay? The time commitment theory is any technique you do requires a certain amount of time, okay? The more time you commit to doing something, the more easily it is to counter it or defend against it, okay? Mm-hmm. Counterattack it or defend against it. So that you learn to, to do things in terms of, uh, like, uh, he, Bruce explained it by clicks. A lot of people don't know this stuff, but clicks. In other words, when you, when you take a, a, a movie camera and you film something, you're not filming motion, you're, you're filming still photographs, okay? So if you take a still photograph, for example, of let's say that the, the, the basic trap, maybe you start here, you go around here, you go here, you go down here, you go here, you trap here, you go, you've, you've seen all that stuff, okay? Uh, well, then... Bremer started telling me how many clicks are there. Mm-hmm. So we got down. So in other words, you don't have to do a lot of that. But, it, but all of that stuff is to learn position, learn different things, just like in, in a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, you learn this is, this is this uh, thing, this is this thing. So with trapping, it's just a relationship. Mm-hmm. But it's to show you the different relationships. For example, if, if a guy punches and you're rightly using a left lead, you can if he jabs and you can break through and do a trap here, that's trapping the arm. But you don't go here and then you go here. Once you've done that, you don't have to do anything else because he's open. So those other things are for different situations. But people aren't taught that. They go through the this, you do this, and you do this, you do this, you do this. And that's kind of what's called organized despair in JKD. But it comes down to the fact that when we were learning it, uh, for example, 
let's say focus glove drills uh, where you have these different combinations where you go jab, cross combination, jab, hook combination. Okay. We didn't learn any of that. Uh, when you have uh, Kali, you were learning uh, this uh, sobrata roll kind of a thing, the, the box pattern, blah, blah, blah. We didn't learn that. You hit, you hit, he hit, he hit. And so, but you have 10 people that you're training. You can do that. Okay. So that uh, focus gloves, you learn to jab. Okay, this is how you put the jab. Learn this is the cross, and you would just move. You would just do the focus gloves. It was alive. Okay, all of a sudden we're doing these seminars. There's 200 people, so you can't teach it that way. So what you have is seminar information. Seminar information then became what JKD was. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's basically where the problem came with. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't work because it's not taught that way. It's not taught correctly because you can't do it to large groups of people. Does that make any sense at all? Well, it makes a lot of sense. So when you take those movements and you apply them in a live environment and you guys started working up against resisting opponents, how much of the original curriculum were you able to keep and how much did you wind up throwing out? I'll give you some examples. I threw out, well, I, we, Bremer came with 14 things. Okay. Okay, basically 14 things that he focused on. Mm -hmm. The first thing was <clears throat> getting power. <clears throat> Bruce Lee said, uh, Bremer said, a fresh way to, Bruce Lee told Bremer, the best way to win a fight is just knock him out. So I've seen a lot of times when I go to see people when they come from different things, um, there's no power. I mean, they're, now they're standing where they're jabbing instead of doing a, intercepting with the front hand. They're all doing boxing, <clears throat> which is okay. Nothing wrong with boxing, but it's not Jeet Kune Do. So we started really, really working on getting power so that you're really banging. And we started working where a guy steps through with a focus goal like that, you hit it, so you're intercepting and hitting that thing. Once a guy's coming in and once you hit it, uh, you're, you've got to try to develop power, but it's done with a snap at the arm. Uh, you, it's not like this, it's the whole thing snaps and this, this elbow pops out of it like that. So it's like that, so you're hitting a person on the end of the punch. So you're getting a one inch penetration on the end of that thing. That takes a hell of a lot of practice to do that. Because you have to be able to time it just exactly distance, 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 distance. Uh, and so you have to have the guys come in at difference. I did a seminar in, uh, in um, England where a guy who was a, a guy that did a lot of uh, MMA stuff. And uh, I respect MMA. I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of guys. Was uh, We were doing a drill where you step forward with a focus club and you bang that thing like this. And then the guy... Well, he'll do all come in fast, slow, whatever. And then the, the guy would, would lower, lower the level and come in that way, like as if he was shooting. So I said that I punched the, the focus club, you know, you, you come and you punch a focus club. So this guy was, seemed like a nice enough guy. So he wanted to try it with him shooting and me trying to do that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know he was going to come in. He came in like a ton of bricks. And when I caught him, I caught him right here right on the end of that punch and it just stopped the whole thing, boom, like that, which may not, may or may not work in the real world, but that's just what happened that day. And that's not exactly how you defend against that. was just a practice thing. Sure. But anyway, it, it, it really kind of messed up his, his cheekbone. And I was, I didn't want to do that, but sometimes you run into stuff, real crazy stuff. Uh, there was a, a typical example in, in uh, did a sem first seminar in Greece. And uh, my guy was, was a guy that's a, a out of Bruce Lee fan, he'd been over and met in and stuff. And he asked me to come over. And his teacher was, was actually his karate teacher, not a real nice guy. So I, I go to the seminar, I ask, and there's like 10 guys, and they're every black belt karate instructor and martial arts instructor in, in Athens and in Greece. There wasn't any students right. demonstrating this stuff. And that one thing I was doing, I said, okay, we're, I'm going to right lead, he's going to left lead, and you come with a roundhouse kick. Now, I knew they were karate guys. So I said, when, when you come with your roundhouse, it was like, you know, the big, big karate shower, you know, sh rear-legged Shotokan kick sure. type. So, uh, and I said, no, but this probably doesn't work against a Thai boxer because of their stance. I tried to talk about structure and their, their kick is so fast, you're not going to be able to do it. But what we do, if we see this structure here, is we just do a front-legged hook, a front-legged kick to the groin. This guy goes, boom, let me try. I was doing a demonstrating on, on the guy was my host he said let me try yeah. so he did i kicked him in the nuts right he, just, he said it hurt it works that doesn't happen very often but that that does happen sure. because the mindset is, is is very strange in a lot of these places they don't <clears throat> they're so bound on style mm -hmm. they don't outside of that style 
<clears throat> you think some of that's changed since MMA has become so popular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I was uh, doing the, the tournament stuff, um, we had the Shotokan guys. They weren't they weren't coming to Ed Parker's thing because it was stri strictly you had to be Shotokan. Right. We went to Parker's. He had all these different martial arts, but nobody. If you were taking one thing, you didn't go to somebody else. You know, you had all that kind of stuff. Right. You might be able to get away with taking judo and karate, and two different guys, but you're not going to pick Korean karate and Japanese karate. It just wasn't done, you know, at the time. Uh, and so that that just be came style, 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 which I just got out of. But once I started with Inusano, you know, and started seeing that some of this stuff actually did work, and I started throwing this stuff away. I threw away about ninety percent of what I learned in Taiwan. I right. kept Ching Yi because I could make that. I could hit hard with that sucker. You know, because it had the power. Mm -hmm. Long time. To, it was really weird. Okay, he would do a thing where you would, and somebody would do this kind of hit like this, and he start shortening it, make it more powerful. But he never hit anything. So I, when I, we got focus gloves, I found out that what took me two years to get power with over in Taiwan, I could teach somebody that in one lesson <laughs> because they were getting feedback. <laughs> it was just really strange. And but you can really the secret is you have to have total relaxation. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, your arm is just a weight. It's a heavy, it's a heavy hit. And the difference between a heavy hit and a snappy hit is uh, uh, the recovery is much slower with the heavy hit. Mm -hmm. I understand because you're getting through the target. So you have to make sure that, that in terms of combat that you actually can hit the target and because you're not going to have the time because that time commitment theory comes in and it takes more time. So Makes that's sense. how that works. Yeah. So that leads to a kind of a natural question. So I, I went over the two. I know Bert Richardson had a thing where you know traffic didn't work. I went over to the seminar for him a couple years ago. That's what I worked on, and he he came away going, "Yeah, you can make it work, but you have to know how to do it." That's all. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I said the same thing to be to be honest in 1999 in my aliveness videos. But what happened with me was I ran into Randy Couture when he was training for his mm -hmm. second turn back in the UFC, and I I had seen rest and clinch before, but I didn't appreciate it the way I appreciated Gracie Jiu Jitsu or boxing. And I realized how subtle and nuanced Greco Roman wrestling was. Oh yeah. And for our fighters and for, and for me and for training, I can take pretty much all of that and immediately plug it in and make a measurable difference on what they're doing. So some of it would just come down to semantics because much of what you might be calling trapping that you kept would be something that we'd be doing, or you might see commonly used now in the in the UFC, uh, in wrestling, in the clinch. But the the names of the delivery systems gets changed. Just one of the reasons why I don't even like talking about names of martial arts. I've always tried to just talk about delivery systems and range. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Range is, is the big deal. Yeah, and mobility, resume, but all of that kind of stuff. But that that brings me to another question that everybody's going to be mad if I don't ask, which is, how do you see? Um, JKD evolving or, or, or going in future generations given the advent of, of the UFC? Do you think it still has a place? Do you think we'll see it in the cage or uh, it's more for self-defense? Where do you think it is? Uh, it's both. You can, there are certain, certain things you can use from it. It's really valuable for, for the ring. Mm -hmm. I, I, I worked with a couple of guys. I'm not going to mention who they were, but they were champions. But there, Eric can tell you who they were. I went with Eric once to work with a guy. And of course, then they had the, they had the, stand-up teacher, which Eric was basically at that time doing that, and the other side of guy was a grappling teacher. No, it was he first. Uh, Eric had all the grappling done. This one guy was a boxing guy. So we, I spent all the time working with this one guy on getting a, a palm hook like that and uh, how to get the power in that. And uh, how to it, it, when you trap, when a guy goes like this, mm -hmm. okay, you can either trap by moving your arm this way, or if he has like like this, it's a, that jut sound is not done like, like it's done in the uh, – uh, the books and the magazine, it's a boom, it's just like that. It's that fast. And I was teaching that to him. So he gets in the ring and uh, and he immediately uh, tries to think, boxer guy, he says, throw, throw a jab, throw a jab, he throws a jab, the guy gets him on the ground and wins the fight. Uh, because he didn't, didn't work, he, he thought that the boxing thing could, could win that and it couldn't, you know, just the guy was too good a grappler. Mm -hmm. This guy was a, a champion, he was a UFC heavyweight champion. Sure. Weird. A weird experience you know yeah yeah so um where do you think 
how do you think CJKD evolving in future generations? I don't know. I, I, I try to, I kind of stay out of that uh, kind of thing because what we've done is kind of uh, different. You know, it's quite a bit different. We folk by focusing on, on certain things and not learning 50 million things. Uh, it's about a few things done well. So it's like, it's like anything else. You got to practice things a, a million different times. For example, to, to intercept, uh, which is the key to what we do, it takes forever to learn how to do it. So uh, Bruce had shown Bob a thing called the hammer principle, which is a thing where, where you stand, you stand a guy and he's about, uh, he has to step towards you. That's the whole key of controlling distance. If the step towards you, that gives you time to react. Okay. If he's within range, any good fencer knows if a guy can reach out and touch you, you're dead. Okay. Right. So you've got to be able to have that extra time. So you start off at that, that thing uh, at what's called a fighting measure. And the, and the guy, the guy, works on dropping the hand and coming in as fast as he can. So you're there and you have your hands like this and you, you block them and you just tell them, okay, um, this is what I saw. Mm -hmm. Drop your body. So that what happens is you do this over and over again. This sucker guy gets better and better and better at hiding his preparation because what you're watching is for his preparation. Sure. And after a while, you can start almost seeing intention. intention. Mm -hmm. Really, you can't. Very few people get that way. I can do it sometimes. I get out there and do that. But what happens is the better this guy gets, the better you get. Right. And you do it on him. So finally, you can really, you can really see it happening. You might have that happen. And to be able to do that, you can't do 500 things. Hmm. You just have to do that over and over and over and over. Now, for MMA and stuff, to be able to do that, there's no time. Right. There's no time to do that. So we're, we're fortunate that in, in my garage and stuff, we can take the time to focus on two or three things at a night, mm -hmm. getting power, for example, uh, learning to see his intention. And, you know, you know you, I, I have two guys and they start, well, I, okay, just go. And then the guy's got to start, I go, boop. As soon as he hits or starts to hit, I, could, I go, I make a sound. And he goes, what, how did you know? And I said, well, you're doing this, you're doing that. When you start thinking that way, uh, Bremer said he went out to eat with Bruce once. And Bruce said, look, that guy's got to pick up the salt shaker. i got to pick up the salt shaker. And Bert also had a, had a kind of a weird deal. He, we, when we went to the Smoky Mountain camp, uh, they had sparring there. Uh, well, there was a big sparring deal where you would spar different guys. And, and before that, anything started, Bert would sit there with me and we'd watch guys walk. Hey, see that guy? This is how he's going to fight. See this guy is what he's going to do. See this guy is what he's going to do. And damned if every one, one guy was a runner, one guy was a puncher. One, but after he said, they did. So he could read that just in how the guy walked. It was really weird, he was a weird dude, but really a cool guy. That's interesting. Um, <clears throat> if you could go back in time, you've been training martial arts a long time. You've seen the evolution of the massive evolution that's, that's occurred since Bruce's time to, to now. Is there anything you'd change? I would I would have focused more a lot more when I was younger at the gun the grappling. Like, you know, I would have got taken in the shoot and the, and the and the I wouldn't have stuck with, with just one thing. But I would I would take the BJJ, and I would also look into some of the uh, the other uh, uh, the other jujitsu systems in Japan. Some of those still have some pretty good things value. I've seen some of it, and some of it's pretty good. Some of it I like just because of some of their their massage and medicine thing worked out pretty good. Some of those Okasaki jujitsu guys have some pretty good stuff. Um, and I would I would work into catch wrestling and, and and I would do do a lot of that kind of stuff too. But you know when you get to be a certain age, ain't nobody gonna be choking me out because I don't want to get that plaque in my neck to go to my brain. You know that kind of thing. Sure. I would I would have done more than that. You know I've done more of that. But uh, I, I I get I realize I, I'm very aware of it. You know I've been around it so much with Eric and stuff. I, I really appreciate it and stuff. And I'm but I'm not I wouldn't say I'm any good at it but I kind of know how to fight it a little bit, you know? So the first person I heard of, and, and you would know this better than me, so you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the first person I heard of that really got clued in to Gracie Jiu Jitsu through the JKD community, I think was Hal Faulkner. Yeah, Faulkner. Is, and I heard a story that he'd actually come back to the Kali Academy in the seventies and told people about that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hal was one of the first ones. That's why Bunak got involved with it. I think Bunak, uh, he mentioned it. Bunak. Yeah, Hal. Hal became a... In fact, last time I saw Hal, uh, he was under uh, Hickson. Yeah. With Hickson. Yeah, Hal was the first one to do it. In fact, 
uh, we would work with Larry. When I remember, way God, way back there, Hal and I were working with Larry, and I was learning some of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu uh, from Hal. Mm-hmm. And we were with Larry, and, and, and uh, it was kind of cool. You know, Larry, Larry, because he was, you know, he had a he would get, get that relaxation thing. That was a hard thing to to get out of him. You know, just to relax, man, relax. Use your body weight. You know, yeah. <laughs> he became very good, <clears throat> very good at it. Yeah, that's true. But it was different. Uh, let's say the difference between ring and 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 uh, uh, I try to teach the guys between the ring and the street. Okay, people think it's rules. No, it's not. It, the rules is part of it, but that's the main. That's the main. It's prior knowledge. Mm-hmm. For example, you take uh, faking and fainting. Okay, like a progressive indirect attack. Okay, mm-hmm. if I'm watching, okay, I'm gonna be have my one of my guys gonna be fighting a, in an MMA match. Okay. Look, this guy runs. This guy does this. This guy does that. So work on that. Work on that. And so you could do a guy runs. So you can do a progressive indirect attack and then kick him. Okay. Mm-hmm. But you go in the street. You have no idea what the hell the guy's going to do. So I can't do a progressive indirect attack because he's watched some MMA shit. And I'm on the ground. Okay. Mm-hmm. So in other words, a lot of stuff you have to throw out the window in the street and just go down to the simplest shit you can think of, and you skip all of the other crap. That's not crap, but progressive indirect attack. First of all, once, once we just started working on progressive indirect attack, it didn't work against the guy who intercepted you. You sure. fake and hit. Okay. So they stopped doing it. And then we would do a lot of, Bremer did a lot of stuff with the leg obstruction with Bruce, where you, you come in, you, you trap the leg with that, and then you either do it as an attack. So if I want to stop him from intercepting me, I have to obstruct his leg so he can't kick and he can't punch. So it's a lot of time spent on that. That's a very awkward thing to get. Once you get that and we started sparring, we, that people say, wait a minute, don't do that because nobody's doing anything. Because it was so easy to do that. As soon as a guy moves, you just lay obstruct and hit him. Trap it. And you're trapping. It's just knocking him down and hitting him. Sure. Cable trapping. It's not, it's not like step, 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 step. It's not that kind of a thing. Uh, so a lot of stuff we couldn't do. And, and so you just stop doing a lot of it because it doesn't work against us. In other words, if it doesn't work against a JKD guy, against a box, good boxer, or against a good – uh, grappler of some kind, I'm not going to bother with it. Right. You know? that's uh, but that's, that's not, it's not politically correct within the JKD world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> to say that progressive injury attack is great and people need to know it, but we don't, we teach it to not do it, you know, so they understand it. And then we try to work against it. It, it, it just, it boom, it, the guy fakes and you hit him. You know, right. we, when it boils down to the simplicity of the art, there's less stuff that you work on. Sure. You can't make a living doing that. People want a lot of tricks. Well, you can't yeah. imply, for, for some Thai boxers, they get away with doing that kind of thing. I'm trapping hard. But for some reason, it doesn't seem to translate over into just doing, just doing this, this, this kind of intercepting thing for two hours. You know, it just doesn't translate over. They want to learn stuff or they want to sweat like crazy, you know? I wonder how much of that is pre-framed expectations when I first um, I was teaching at a Jeet Kune Do community back in the early 90s and after meeting Hickson and having that kind of wake up moment for me I opened up my own place because I realized I'm I was just going in a different direction all I cared about was what functionally worked in a fight yeah, yeah well, what's all my JKD peers everybody uh, told me it was not going to work People want to click sticks together. People want to collect certificates. You're not going to make any money. And I'll tell you what, I had five gyms going at once within like 18 months because everybody wanted to do that. Yeah. yeah. There's a huge market for people that want the truth. Yeah. But just do a pure JKD. I mean, I never had a lot of students. Uh, because we worked uh, I, I bet if you, if, if you had a class where, where you were just working that kind of material and, and people knew about it, we could get it filled up pretty quick. I, I think sometimes, I think the mindset's changed a little bit. There's a lot of people that want, I think, I, 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 let me rephrase that. It's not that I, I think sometimes some instructors in Jeet Kune Do have underestimated the intelligence, of the audience and the, and, and uh, in a kind of condescending way, because there's so many people that want what's real. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you, because I know that, you know, that's one of the things you, you focused on. And, and I, I actually think there's a huge market for what you do. Well, yeah, I could, I could kind of go around as I could go out to different MMA schools yes. and, do, and do little little workshops. That's what I do with Eric. I go there and do a workshop on some certain things, you know. 
I'm just not into, I'm too old now to give a shit about it. Yeah. So I don't really care about it anymore. I'm kind of retired from doing all that. Yeah. You know? uh, but I, I enjoy going to see Eric and playing. Uh, I enjoyed, uh, I, actually, one of the cool guys I met doing these uh, seminars, we get together with different guys, uh, Hawk Hawkheim, uh, Jim McCann, and the, the guy in, in uh, uh, I think it was in Texas, uh, was Austin, Texas, pretty good guy. Uh, he uh, had me come to a seminar and there was a, there was a, a guy there, it was a big, big, tall guy. He was uh, Australian. And he was the dude that uh, started telling him, talking about uh, how to avoid the fight. Mm -hmm. I, I've done that on, I don't know if you've seen the YouTube thing on how. Yeah, that, that, your, your verbal jujitsu. At, yeah, that's yeah. this guy. He's the one who taught that at that thing. That's where I learned it from. I, I always tell who did it, you know, all that stuff. Okay. I can't name right now, but uh, I, I, I do give him credit for it because yeah. he was. I'll think of it in a minute or two, but just being to be 80 shit and working for me. But uh, he was, he was uh, really, really good at that. And it made perfect sense to me, you know, that, uh, so it's all that is work and the guy's going to piss the guy off. Well, it's, it's, it's something, you know, right. It, and then the guy attacks you and at least you, he's makes the first move. So, you know, sure. But, I, I thought that was a great, that was a great I speech. think it was the name of it right there on my top of my head. But uh, anyway, uh, if I think of it, I'll, I'll uh, shoot you an email, whatever the guy's name is. He's sure. a really good guy, really a good guy. Big talk about six, seven, six, eight, you know, big dude. Eric also said I should, I should ask you about a time that a sea lot instructor came in and started screaming out like fire, water, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. <laughs> this, was a, this was not a, obviously not a legitimate uh, uh, sea lot guy because there are good sea lot guys. But yeah, yeah, he came in and uh, he wanted to uh, – it was just kind of weird. Sometimes you get these guys coming out of my little garage. And for some people, they come from all over, all over the world just to kind of take pictures in there, you know, because it became kind of a famous gig deal because it's so unusual. And sometimes guys come in because they want to check it out, you know. So um, we've had guys come in to do that. But this guy came in and he wanted to his, – his guy was, uh, was going to be fighting in the ring. He's doing all this stuff. And he was going to be a boxer and all this stuff. He's, you know, he knew all this stuff. So he, he, uh, he wanted to uh, spar. So he sparred one of my guys, Dennis Blue. And Dennis Blue was a uh, – well, he, he, uh, he was in Special Forces. And also he spent some other time working in different, different gigs and stuff. So he wasn't somebody to mess around with. But he was being nice. The guy would uh, do this and that. And, and, they, and he was just didn't have a chance. The guy was just terrible. The guy would say, no, no, not water, fire, fire. Oh, no, dude, he was doing those five element stuff. And it was so funny. The guy was terrible. But that happened. And we've had, uh, had guys come in and say, uh, you know, you can't do this to me and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, so we just do it to them. The funny one, when you get guys that, that visit other schools and then they come in to visit your school and they want to spar afterwards, and you you have them you 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 watch us practice kicking the focus glove and kicking this and doing that and it's wham bam bam and you look up and they're they're not there anymore. That that happens, you know, quite yeah. a bit. Of times, you know, it used to happen in, in Bruce's school too because he used to hit hard. Uh, the hitting hard bit is is not is not there as much as it used to be because it just so, takes that much work. It does. Um, I guess one a couple of the last questions I, I'll ask you is um, what disconnects, if any, did you find between what you were being taught um, and what you wanted or what you wanted to be able to accomplish in the, in the martial arts through your training? That was, I, I don't know. It gave me a, what I did learn was uh, particularly from working with certain people, really Bremer and Bert and these guys, was to be able to analyze. Uh, for example, we had Sonny, former Navy SEAL. He was, a, he was our long-range shooting instructor because we also believe in guns. I do have a few guns. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and he was a knife maker. And I had Bert. I had Dennis Blue, who was Special Forces. I had uh, this Army Ranger dude come in and had all kinds of grappling stuff, Lloyd Kennedy. So we had all these people. So what would happen? Lloyd was a cool guy. He came in and said, look, I'm going to show you some stuff. And if you see anything that's open, let me know because I want to learn it here and not in the street. Right. OK, 
Okay, they had that attitude. So that's the attitude they came with. So that I would I would go and I was still doing blah 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 with different people, and learning different arts and stuff. You know, different sea lot stuff, different this. I would go with the arts were, but everything everybody was doing, I was doing some of it, and I would show it, and these guys would say. What are you shitting me? <laughs> what are you doing that for? And Bremer would say something, Bert would say something. So it said, look, if you do that to me, now here, that's what's going to happen to you, blah, blah, blah. So it was a constant analysis. Of, one thing was Bremer used to stress what Bruce stressed it. What are they offering you? What are they offering you? Take advantage of what they're offering you. So it was a constant analysis of, of technique, what worked, what didn't work, right from the get go when those guys started showing up. Right. There was none of this, I'm going to show you something that's got to be magic. What happened, and just between, this is a podcast, but just between us, a lot of things what happened was that uh, if you're, let's say, let's say you're, you're a teacher, and then you start, you get really good at something, and uh, then you start learning a different art, and then, and then you're teaching students, you want to teach your students that art, okay? I want to share with you, but I'm learning. Mm-hmm. There's no analysis. There's not, you know, usually don't say this, this is, this is what he's showing me. This works, but this one doesn't work. This works here, but it doesn't work there. That analysis thing is gone. You're just accepting this whole package. Right. And you go to this other dude and you're accepting that whole package. And that's what happened is you got all of a sudden, you've got 10 different packages from all these different martial arts where really you just have one art and that's you. Yeah. You understand that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes total sense. So, um, what advice would you offer somebody that's watching us on the podcast right now, but who really they don't want to do, they're not necessarily interested in doing MMA or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. They want to train Jeet Kune Do. What would you tell them to, to do? What would you tell them to focus on? Find somebody who can, who, who can, who actually just teaches it and, and actually works on the basics of it and getting it down. I don't think it, it's hard to find. It's hard to find guys. I mean, they're all over the damn place, but I don't know. I don't really know any anymore. I just stayed out of all that whole that whole bit for the last maybe fifteen years or so, twenty years. I've kind of stayed out of. I don't go visit anybody. I don't do anything. So I, I'm very unaware of what's. Got. I know there's some good guys out there. You just got to go out there and you got to say, is this guy open to analyzing? You know, that's what it all comes down to. What works and what doesn't work. You know. Right. That's that's what that's the name of that tune, you know. I don't want to get caught out in the street with something, you know. I I know how to use weapons, I know how to use a gun, but you know, I Lord knows I've got plenty of and you live in Portland and yeah. I pisses me off so much because I love Portland. My yeah. wife we were just talking a couple of years ago, you know when when I retire, let's go spend a week in Portland. Uh, because it's such a cool place. Ain't no more. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. I just not gonna go there, you know. And I loved it. I think Portland was Portland. Portland was a pretty damn nice place. A little hippy dippy, but it was good, you know. It was cool. That was when they were the gentle hippies, you know. The not, real, not the antifa assholes. So yeah. you know. No, I couldn't agree with you more. Some of my uh, my neighbors, and I'm sure some people that are gonna watch me on this will be mad at me when I when I say that. But the truth is, I'm, I wouldn't. If you were to come visit here, I wouldn't want you and your wife walking around downtown at night. Right now, it's not safe. We had, so between January and what is it now? Uh, shoot, I think it's the, the 10th or something. So between January and March 10th or 11th of last year, we had one homicide. We've had 20 homicides since January this year. 20. It's cops, you know, but they, you know, why would a cop even want to bother trying to mess with everybody? Now, the, you know, in, in LA, <clears throat> the guy, the head of, <clears throat> the guy is a, one of these new progressive DAs that he, it's not against the law to resist arrest. Yeah. We have the same problem. What the hell is that? Yeah. Uh, why would a cop, why would a cop try to arrest anybody? Right. If I resist you just, Oh, sorry, you know, go away. Yeah. You know, what the hell, you know, what, it doesn't even make any sense at all. And they get rid of, they get rid of anything that you can use that is, is maybe non lethal. Right. I mean, hardly use pepper spray anymore or, or, uh, anything like that you know yeah no i couldn't agree with you more and unfortunately i think it's going to be 
Portlanders have no idea what's going to happen this summer because it's been cold. Once it starts to get warm, the shootings are going to skyrocket and there's going to be a whole lot of people dead. Eventually, they'll realize they need to hire enough police to be able to manage a city this size. But by then, how many people How many people that were killed that didn't have to otherwise be killed? Yeah, see, then the cops, the cops can't really... You've got to change the law. You've got to say that cops you know, have at least the, the idea that maybe they're innocent in the situation of shooting because this whole cop shooting people is not true. Right. Statistics don't bear it out, you know, that it's not it's not borne out. You know, my uh oldest tacky grandson, he's he's graduated from college. He's a, he has his teaching credential, but he's interested in being a cop. A Redlands cop though is a pretty good gig because Redlands is a very peaceful, kind of a cool place after you can see the mountains right now, there's snow on them, you know, so it's kind of nice here. Nice. Uh we get good weather and stuff. But he's thinking about trying to be a cop and uh, go, I don't know, man. But it's it's not it's not an L like L A cop. Yeah, you know? it's not now. It's probably not the best time. Every I know a lot of police officers. We have a lot of police officers in the organization, but they're all either retiring or planning on retiring or planning on getting a second career. Nobody wants to be in this job right now. No, a young cop, you got to get the hell out. You know? Yeah, yeah. I actually did a uh, I did a debate with an author on police shootings. I'll send you the link after we hang up. You can take a look, but. Uh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I just want to thank you for, for taking the time to talk with me. I really appreciate it. It's been an honor. Oh, well, thank you, man. It's good talking to you. I, we talked one time over the phone and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you know, good. Gosh, it's nice to talk to you, man. So, uh, like I said, it's, I'm, I'm a little bit different than most of the, most of the guys. So That's the kind of different I like. And, uh, you know, I've been able, I feel super fortunate. I've been able to make my, my living, raise my family for the last 25 years just teaching yeah, Fun functional martial arts. But I also recognize I wouldn't have been able to do it without your generation and you guys um, were kind of standing on your shoulders. So I'm grateful for that. And I want to, you know, I want people no, to see you and I, know who you are. I was happy I didn't have to do it for a living because I was a school teacher. I was making pretty good money and I have pretty good retirement and uh, yeah. retirement and everything taken care of. And the teachers are just taking good care of me. So. Yeah. But you know, if you're in it, you get a good gig. But I, I used to just to drive them crazy because I was I was sort of a non going along with them kind of stuff. You know, nice. <laughs> they, they would they would say uh, you would go over and you would you would the teacher you you get in your mailbox every election you get uh, a thing where you would have who would uh, this is before cancel culture and yeah. you would have you supposed to vote for in the union. I take I the faculty lounge and all these people are sitting around it. I go, wow, I just got this from a teacher's you know who to vote. I really like this because I just vote the opposite. <laughs> they would get so pissed off. I like it. <laughs> well, thank you again, Tim. I, I really appreciate it. I'll, I'll send you that link. Um, I'll send you this link when we put the podcast up. And I'm not worried about it, man. Don't worry about it. I don't have to cut anything. Well, no, I, I mean, I'll, yeah, I appreciate that too, but I'll send it to you when we put it online so you can watch it. And, um, want to look at me doing it <laughs> if you uh if you ever have anything you want to say or you want to you you know uh, no i just appreciate talking to you and i i it should be about old, old hal Faulkner. he was he's one of the great guys now when i first went to uh larry hartzell i uh, met larry uh when i started you got a second more on this oh yeah i've got all the time in the world i, I just didn't want to get, get you tired in about 1975, 76, I was going to go, my wife's Cajun, so we were going to go to Louisiana with my kids, and then we were going to go up to Virginia to visit my brother, who was retired from the Air Force. He was living there, and her sister was, was living up in Virginia, too. Her, her uh, husband was a Navy dude. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I was going, uh, Dan said, well, you know, could you stop by Larry Hart? So Larry Hart said he had a, actually had a school, a Jay Kundo school, when but the only ones who had, actually had a Jeet Kune Do school advertised as well, Jeet Kune Do. Uh, so I said, would you stop by and spend some time with, with Larry Hartzell and uh, work with him on some of the stuff we were working on? I'm showing some of the Kali, work with him at the screaming, and, and then work with him on some of the stuff we're doing that said he maybe he hadn't had a chance to see. So I stopped by and then Larry, uh, get met Larry. He was a, you know, really good guy. And so, I started teaching this, this little group of guys, and Hal Foster and Del Pollard were one of them. Hal had come in from Philadelphia, and uh, uh, I think uh, Del Pollard was coming from somewhere in, in the Midwest. And uh, they really liked what I was showing them so much that they moved out to uh, LA to start working with Inusano. 
And that's, I really got to know those two guys. And then Larry started coming up and then I started teaching with Larry at all the martial arts. He started teaching more of the grappling kind of stuff and I would teach more of the stand up stuff. I became very close with Larry, but I had an awful lot of interesting experiences with Larry. We're going to have to talk about that sometime. He was it's just you and I. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He so, was uh, one of my favorite Jeet Kune Do instructors of all time. I had the privilege of bringing him up to Oregon a few times and I always enjoyed it. He was a good guy. We, he was like my brother and stuff, you know, but I had some uh, wild times, wild times. He might add a few himself. Who knows? You know? I had a few. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and reach out to Hal, too, because I'd like to talk to Hal. I'd like people to, to hear from him, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's a good guy. Yeah. All right, take it easy, man. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, take it easy. Bye. High five. High five. There you go, brother. Take it easy, brother. Take care. All right, bye.